Welcome, everyone, and thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about deep learning. Uh, it's a very popular topic, it seems. But I'm going to focus on NLP, so natural language processing. And uh, so I'm Anna Peleteiro, and I'm currently the data science director at Tendam, uh, which is a global fashion retail. Uh, before that, I did a PhD in artificial intelligence, and I was working in Salando, uh, also a fashion company, as a senior data scientist. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Tendam. So Tendam is, uh, we recently changed the company name. Uh, it's a global fashion retail company that has five brands. So it's, uh, the first one is Corte Fiel, Pedro del Hierro, Springfield, Women's Secret, and also 50 Factory. So uh, we found the, the company is pretty old. It was founded in uh, 1880, so a while ago. The fashion style was different back then. Uh, we have more than 2,000 physical shops uh, in 89 countries, more than 10,000 employees, and we have a model where we have all our own shops and franchises. And the interesting, so what is, what is interesting and different for me is that before I was working in Salando, which is completely online, but uh, in, in Tandem we have both the physical shops and the online shops, which poses uh, many different challenges also. So uh, I'm going to get started with the actual topic of the day, so uh, deep learning for natural language processing. So we have all seen in the previous talk, AWS or even Image into the Wild, that deep learning is having a transformative impact in many of the fields that it has been applied for the last years. And this is for several reasons. Deep learning is not, let's say, it's not new. It has been here for a while. But before, we didn't have the computation uh, capabilities or even the data because you need a lot of data to train. Well, it depends on the problem, obviously, but you need quite some data to train machine learning models. And it's not so easy to get labeled data, and even more for depending which problems, right? So NLP was somehow what behind other fields. So deep learning started strong with the uh, image, but NLP was a little bit behind. Uh, but that's, that has changed in the last years uh, for several reasons, but one of them is the RNNs and also word embeddings. And there are many different fields where uh, deep learning is making a, a huge impact in NLP, such as in uh, machine learning, machine translation, sorry, image captioning, and some other fields. So I'm going to explain a little bit about word embeddings, because they are really important. And uh, maybe some of you know, maybe you don't. So with image and with audio, we can encode using uh, IDs. So for example, I have a pixel. I can represent it with a number. And I know that if it's one, that number plus one, that means that it's going to have more intensity. Or uh, So that makes sense. But what happens with words is that we, if we try to represent them with IDs, firstly, encodings are arbitrary. So imagine that I have a word that is chair, and I have a word that is table. And I'm going to say, this is ID 1, and this is ID 5. I don't know how they are related, right? Then another problem is that. Uh, they are quite sparse. It's not like with, uh, with image that you have your pixels. Uh, the, the words, if you try to encode it as uh, IDs, they're going to be sparse. So a better representation for words, what can that be? Well, uh, that can be a vector. So in that manner, you can have vectors that represent the words, and you can position them so that the words that are similar are going to be closer, and you can have a context around the words, right? So that's why we want to learn uh, dense vectors for embedding vectors. So there are different ways that you can calculate these uh, word embeddings. The two popular ones and that uh, were uh, brought by Mikolov was uh, Skipran and, uh, and Sibo. So with the first one, what you do is you predict tar target words from the context. So for example, say that them them today's talk, I want to predict that word. And with Skipram, I want to predict the context words around the, around the word in the middle. So tandem conference talk, right? So using word embeddings has become a standard preprocessing step for many NLP problems, and not only within uh, deep learning, but also for supervised approaches. So there are several papers where the authors are doing clustering, or they're using the word embedding features as a, as a input, for example. And there are several, when we're trying to build these, these word embeddings, there are several parameters that we can experiment with, such as the word embedding size or the, or the context window. And also, it has to be said that word embeddings are somewhat uh, uh, context dependent. So in different fields, the word embeddings are, for some fields, you may need to build your own word embeddings. Uh, there are also several papers that try to 
diminish this problem, but uh, this is the case in many domains. And coming from a fashion domain where you will see that people in fashion talk, they like the floritures and use really complex language, they, made up war they make up words, so it's kind of important in this domain. So something that is also being used quite a lot nowadays in deep learning is the character embeddings. And why are they important? Well, word embeddings are really good at capturing the sem syntactic and the semantic information, so the context around the word. However, for different tasks, such as uh, part of speech tagging or name entity cognition, that's, that's not enough. Because you need more the intra-word morphological information, so subtalk and back patterns, suffix, prefixes. And also for other problem that is quite common in NLP is the out of vocabulary word. So if I see a word that I haven't seen before and there's no word embedded for that, so what do I do, right? Uh, and also this can be used in languages where there's no, uh, there are no separated words, such as uh, Chinese, for example. So using character embeddings, we can overcome these problems. And again, this is something that is being used together with the word embeddings in many different, in many different problems. So um, in the previous talk, uh, the speaker was talking about the uh, CNNs and how they can be used for, for image processing. Well, they are not only used for image processing, but also for, for NLP. But they're, they're really effective uh, for computer and vision text, and they have the ability to extract the most salient uh, engram features, right? And for example, it could be used, CNNs could be used in NLP to represent the sentence for a downstream task, and they have been used for summarization and classification. However, I'm not going to focus, I'm, I just wanted to mention this because they can be used, uh, but uh, I'm going to focus on other type of networks that are more relevant for, for NLP, which are the recurrent neural networks. Uh, so why don't we use uh, basic deep nets or CNNs for for, um, for NLP. Well, traditional neural networks and CNNs don't use information from the past, right? So each entry is independent. And we all know that the context is really important because if I, like, the first slides here have been context for you. So your brain has been uh, predisposed for what I'm going to say now with, with what, what I've said before. If all of a sudden now all what I said was uh, erased from your brain, your interpretation may be different and you may not understand why, why is this girl talking about uh, RNNs, right? So, as I said, uh, deep nets and CNNs are fine for, for some applications, but for example, for video, language modeling, machine translation, we need to know the past to be able to predict the future, right? So, that's why RNNs are so important, because these kind of uh, networks are able to condition the, the network with the previous information for what's going to come in the future. And also, they, ha they can handle uh, different size uh, inputs, which is also really important. So what's an RNN? Well, basically, this type of networks, as I said, make use of sequential information. So basically, the output is dependent on the previous. So they are called recurrent because basically you're applying the same operation to, to, the, next, uh, to the next inputs. So for example, let me see if this works. Okay. So, Basically, you have the different units, right? So imagine that this would be a word. So you input the word. You have a hidden state, and then you, you create an output that, for example, I will show later this could be a word. And basically what you do is you recurrently apply this to different words, right? And so this would be the words. This would be the hidden states, uh, the nonlinearity, and you just keep on applying that. And the RNN, in the RNNs, you, say, you share the same W for, for the different steps, so that, that also is a, something that is really interesting. So for example, and this, this is more visual to understand, so say that I want to predict the next word in a sentence, right? So I would input what, then the first hidden state, which is normally initialized to, it can be initialized to different things depending on the problem. So for example, for image captioning, uh, it could be the image, but this could be different things. And then, okay, so I will output, this would be the prediction, I think the next word is is, and then you just keep on going through the network. With this hidden state, you will input here another hidden state, which is A2, and you will predict, okay, with is, I'm gonna predict that this is the, right? And you keep on, you keep on moving. So in theory, RNNs are able to handle long-term dependencies. So imagine that you have a really long sentence, right? So 
in theory, RNN will say, okay, I will remember about all the words that you have said, and I'm gonna take them into account, and I will, and I will predict the word. However, this is a bit different in practice, right? And why is this? Well, this is because of bad propagation through time. So I said before that parameters are shared in different time steps in RNNs. So this means that when you're bad propagating, you're bad propagating through all the steps as well. So that, so that then the gradients, there are two problems that can happen. So we can have exploding gradients. So that means that the gradient is gonna go uh, to a really high values. And this is not so bad as compared to the other problem that I'm gonna mention because they are easy, easier to spot. So if you're training a network and all of a sudden you see that your gradient is going really, really high, then you kind of kind of guess that there's a problem there with, with this. And for example, one, one thing that you can do to, to avoid this problem is to clip the, the gradient to a maximum. And this has been used in many different papers. The other problem that we have is the vanishing gradients. And this is a bit tricky because what happens is that the gradient goes decreasing through the different time steps, right? And this is harder to, to identify. Uh, the, the different options that we have for this is that we can uh, in, initialize the matrix to identity matrix, or another thing that we can do is we can use a nonlinearity that is a relo instead of a sigmoid. So as I said, uh, RNNs can handle somewhat the long-term dependency. So imagine this sentence. This would be like a typical fashion uh, sentence. So the oversized manis coats look positively edible over the band skimming dresses while combined with novelty network such as fun like fishermen sweaters. And I'm not going to go on, but you get the message, right? So imagine that you would have to uh, predict that word or even that you would have to translate it, right? So there's a lot of information there. So in order to avoid the problem that we were talking about before, there are two different uh, there are the LSTMs and the GRUs that avoid this long-term dependency problem. And how do they do this? Well, they remove or add information to a cell state. And in that manner, they have uh, some gates that regulate the information that flows through. And uh, we can decide, and they decide what's important to keep and what's not important to keep. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain now a little bit about that. So the LSTMs, uh, they have this structure so basically, I'm just gonna, I mean, I'm not gonna go through the equations, but just so that you have them there. So basically what happens here is, okay, so I have different gates that are gonna let some information go through or not. I have the new memory. So first thing, I'm gonna say, okay, what information is important from the new world, right? So I calculate that here, I, I put it through, and I generate a new memory. However, I'm gonna say, oh, what's important from the new world? But I need to know, is the new world that I'm gonna input important? So that's why I have this input uh, gate. So is xt, which would be the new world, important for me for the next state? Then we have the forget gate, which is calculating if the previous cell state is important or not. So it, it says, should I forget about the previous cell state or not? And in that matter, we calculate this new memory state. And the final thing that the LSTM has is an output exposure gate. And this is because we don't want to expose this full memory state because there are things that we don't, we don't need for the, for the hidden state. So this output gate is gonna calculate that, right? And this is how it avoids carrying information that is not important, only carrying the one that is important for the next state. There is this other uh, network that is called uh, GRUs, and it's very similar to LSTMs. The only difference is that it doesn't have that memory, extra memory that we said in LSTMs, and that's why they're also becoming popular. So until now, LSTMs were the most popular for most of the problems, but now people are also starting using GRUs because they are somewhat more efficient for this uh, lack of the memory that is needed. So the idea is very similar, basically, you have a reset gate that says, okay, do I need to include my previous hidden state in my, in my new uh, memory? Then it will also compute the new memory based on your current input word, which would be XT and, and your previous hidden state. And it will have an update uh, gate that will say how much of the previous hidden state you need for the next hidden state. And that, that is uh, basically how it's calculated. 
So there are different RNA and architectures for different types of problems. I mean, and there are many more than these ones, but I'm just going to show some examples here so that you get an idea. So this would just be like a normal vanilla deep neural network, one input, one output. Then we have one to many. So for example, this could be used if we have um, image captioning. So we are going to input uh, an image, and we're going to get a set of words that describe that image, for example. Then we have a many to one. So this could be, for example, we want to classify a sentence into, into a certain type of sentence. So we have a sentiment analysis, a sentiment analysis task, and we want to classify that as well. Then we have, uh, this is uh, really common, so encoder, decoder, many to many. This, is, uh, this could be used, for example, in machine translation. So we are inputting one sentence in English, and we output it in Spanish, for example. And then the final one is the many to many. So this could be used, for example, in, in video uh, or different types of uh, tasks. Finally, something that is gaining a lot of attention, uh, well, not finally, but uh, something that is getting a lot of attention is the attention mechanisms. So what is this? Well, in encoder-decoder um, architectures, what you have to do is you get a fixed size vector here that you will need to use to translate the full sentence, right? And this is not, um, this is not great sometimes because, the, as I said, the, the sentence may be really long, so it would be great that the network learns where to attend depending on what word it's translating, for example. So imagine this architecture, you have your encoder, decoder, you say, I'm a student, and then you go to French, you say, to the end. So basically, what attention mechanisms are doing is they, are help, they, are, they allow the model to attend to different hidden states for each word when, they, when, they, when it's being decoded. So for example, you can see in the, this matrix here, and this is great also because it helps to visualize what things are being translated by how. So for example, if you see here, la Siri is, is actually, la Siri is translated to Syria. So basically the model is saying, I'm attending to these two words when I'm translating this. And in that matter, it helps the translation. And uh, as I said, it's really used right now in different type of problems. So uh, there are many, many, many applications for NLP. Some of them would be word level classification, so name entity recognition, sentence classification, test classification, machine translation. So you have all seen like, that machine translation models have improved a lot in the past years, and it's also due to using this type of, of models. And also what deep learning is helping to is that you don't need to have that much knowledge into the NLP problem. Before, it was a lot about tweaking and having a lot of application knowledge. Now deep learning helps uh, to generalize more in that matter. And other domains that are really important are question answering. So an example that I'd like to, to show is for, you can generate text, for example, using, and this is more like for toy uh, problems, but I think this one is quite funny. So uh, you can actually go and see it in here. So basically, uh, they trained a three-layer RNN with 512 hidden nodes with all the text from Shakespeare, and the, the algorithm was generating new Shakespeare text, but from deep learning. So this was actually generated using uh, this model, and I think it's quite, quite interesting, the things that you can do with this kind of models. And of course, there are more serious problems that we can solve. So for example, question answering is really uh, it's a problem that is very current, for example, for chatbots as well. So imagine that you have this, um, you want to buy something, but you don't have anyone that you can ask. So you go to your chatbot and you say, oh, uh, so I was wondering what's trending this spring. And it will tell you, OK, this spring is all about new wave sleep and, for example, jumpsuits. And I have to say that all this information is true. So if you want to take the tips, it's fine. So you can say, oh, is that appropriate for a work dinner? And you will say, oh, yeah, that totally works. So you can use a chili oil jumpsuit, dark brown belt, and cherry tomato heels. Oh, thank you. That sounds great. So as I said, there are many different problems that we can, that we can solve using deep learning uh, for, for NLP. And what really great thing is that there are really like, a lot of resources out there to learn. So if you want to uh, upskill in this topic, uh, these are just some of them. I would really recommend this paper uh, because it has a really good summary about the recent trends. 
Uh, but as I said, w once you start clicking in one, you get many, many more resources. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of open source code as well, which is great if you want to get started in different languages such as TensorFlow, uh, Keras, etc. So thanks, and I hope that you have enjoyed the talk. <laughs>